In this first demonstration, we're going to take a look at how we can start and stop the different instances of SQL Server running on a single box. We'll take advantage of using a GUI tool as well as using command prompts. To be able to use a GUI tool, we're going to use the SQL Server Configuration Manager tool. To get to this, since this is our first time, we'll come down to the Start button. We'll go to All Programs, Microsoft SQL Server 2008, and over to the Configuration Tools. Then we will choose SQL Server Configuration Manager. This provides us a list of all the components that have been installed in SQL Server on this box, including the SQL Server database engines, as well as some of the other components. We can see here that SQL Server named instance 01 is running simply by looking at the green arrow. We also see that SQL Server instance 02, as well as the default instance, which we just see the name as MSSQL Server. Microsoft SQL Server. What I'm going to do is I have the capability of just coming up and doing a right mouse click over any of my instances and I can stop, pause, or restart them. So I'll click on stop and we'll let this go ahead and start the process of watching the finishing of the instance and it's running. Well, I could click close, didn't even have time if I wanted to get rid of the dialog box. We can now see that the instance 01 is stopped by the red square. Let me minimize this and we'll go look at how we can work with this in a command line. So I'm going to move my cursor back over to start. I'll choose run and from here I'll just go ahead and either type CMD or confirm it by clicking OK. This will bring up a command prompt for us to be able to work with the environment. What I'm going to do is type in net start and I want to start a service running in the Windows environment. In this case, it will be the Microsoft SQL Server. And because I'm going into just the default, we'll type it just like this. When I hit enter, you'll notice that it comes up with an error stating that this service has already been started. And if I need to learn more, I can type net help message 2182. Now, why does this show that it's already started? I th you thought that I stopped it. What I stopped was a named instance, not the default. So I wanted to be able to show to you what happens if you try to start an existing instance. It doesn't change. So let's come back and do a net start of the instance. And in this case, I'll type the MSSQL. And since I'm using a named instance, I provide a dollar sign to help us be able to define the instance name. And in this case, it is instance 01. Now, I intentionally go ahead and do a capitalization here. Not because I have to, but just to be able to show a mix of small case and uppercase. This is case insensitive. It doesn't matter. This is the one we stopped. So as I press the Enter key, we see that it is starting and is quickly started back. If we go back to our SQL Server Configuration Manager, just by looking here, it appears that the instance is not started. The reason being is rather than polling all of our databases and our servers at different times, what we have to do is go ahead and do a right mouse click on the SQL Server Services and click Refresh. This then goes back out to WMI and shows us that the instance 01 is actually started. We're going to talk in a future module, module 14, and look at clustering. But it is important to notice that when you're using clustering, you should use the clustering services to be able to start and stop your instances. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the SQL Server objects that are available to us through another GUI tool. I'll minimize the configuration manager. I'll go ahead and close up my command prompt. Come back here to start. And I'll go back to my all programs and, of course, to Microsoft SQL Server 2008. I will then open up the development environment called SQL Server Management Studio. 
Now, I say it's a development environment because it's based off the initial shell of Visual Studio. But this does not mean that it is strictly only for developers. It is also for DBAs to be able to work with the databases directly. When it first comes up, it gives me an opportunity to sign in to a specific instance. The name of our box, the server, when the Windows operating services were installed, is SQL TBWS. Earlier, I was using a dollar sign when I was working with the services, but I will now use a backslash to reference the instance 01. We'll talk security later, whether we can use the Windows authentication or a special SQL login. In this case, we're just going to leave it as the defaults and click Connect. I'll expand SSMS to be able to show that we are running an instance of 01 of SQL Server and we are doing module, or excuse me, release 10, which is actually SQL Server 2008. We also see the account that I've registered myself in as SQL TBWS as the actual administrator. If we want to take a look at the properties of this, we can do a right mouse click over the instance and come down to the bottom and choose Properties. Within the properties of the instance, we have the capability of seeing several different items right here, including looking at the general information, the memory, the processes, the security. Additional properties that we can look at for the instance are back under the SQL Server configuration. So let's come back down here since I just minimized it. We'll open this up. And in the meantime, we'll also go ahead and remove this require or request to make SQL Server 2008 better. Microsoft, if I go ahead and double click on this, gives you the opportunity to provide customer experience feedback. Note that they have a data privacy statement. They are not going to capture any of your data, just essentially how you're using SQL Server. You have the chance to choose yes or go with the default of no. So we'll click OK and we will not get that prompt anymore. If we come back up to SQL Server Instance 01 here, we can do a right mouse click and look at its properties. From here, we can define how this account is being defined within SQL Server with a specific account name as the service, also providing a password. Since it is a service, we can define how we want to be able to provide this as starting automatically, or it can be disabled when we start up our system, or we have the opportunity just to simply go with manual. We'll talk about file stream later, but we have the capability of using large objects and enabling file stream to help us be able to take advantage of the NTFS file system and sharing data. The Advanced tab allows us to take a look at several additional items, whether we're working in a clustered environment, where is our error logs going to go to, also what are our startup parameters? Later, we'll talk about the necessary files and databases that will allow us to run an instance of SQL Server. But this gives you the information about where the database files and log files which are going to be used. We're going to click Cancel here because I really don't want to make any direct changes. If we come back over to SSMS now, Let's look inside of the instance. We can see that we have some databases. If I expand this, we'll see that we have a couple of special folders. We'll talk about system databases in an upcoming module, as well as how snapshots can work. Inside here, I have multiple instances of a database. I have AdventureWorks, I have AdventureWorks 2008, and these are end-user databases, essentially. Report Server works along with one of the components of SQL Server if we want to do reporting. We also have the capability of looking at security. And the key item I'll look at security right here is that we can look at logins, server roles, uh, working with cryptography keys. 
Now security, as we'll talk about in modules 6 and later in module 9, is security is also at the instance level as well at the database level. If I open up AdventureWorks 2008, you'll see that there is also a security folder here. If I open the security folder here, we can see information about users, roles, and how about schemas? We're used to schemas in Oracle. And we can see that we have some predefined schemas, as well as those that have been created, such as for a human resources application, or production, and purchasing. If we minimize this security, we can also take a look at some of our objects, like tables. If I expand the tables, we can see every single item that is available to us, including those schemas and their specific tables. If we come down and look at, say, person.person, .person, we have the capability of expanding it and looking at the specific columns or triggers and indexes that are available with this particular table. As we'll learn more, we'll see items such as the person type, the name style, the first name, with all their appropriate data types as well. We can also take these items and script the code directly to be able to duplicate or use for backup and recovery methods. Not so much for the database, but as our code and script. If I take person.person .person and do a right mouse click, I have the capability of scripting this table as, say, a create to statement. And what I'm going to have it do is open up what we refer to as a query editor window. I could assign this directly to a file if I wish. I'll go ahead and click this item, and we will see the appropriate create table statement being able to be populated and changed if we wish. We'll talk more about the actual Transact SQL language, but we can see that it's pretty similar to Oracle. We create a table, we define its schema, the table itself, as well as several other items and columns. Not only can we work with just one instance inside of the SSMS tool, but we can also connect to additional instances. Let me go ahead and click Connect right here for a database engine. And instead of opening just Instance 01, I'm going to open up Instance 02 so that I can review it. Now, I have the capability of looking at the objects and the services available under Instance 02. You can have a wide number of instances, not just on the same box, but if you have access through a local area network or some trusted network, you have the capability of bringing in any number of instances which you want to build to manage. Now, let's go ahead and talk about where this information is actually stored for the databases. To do this, we're going to open up Windows Explorer. And the best ways to get to this typically is if you have never used it, you can go to Accessories and Windows Explorer. Or we've already got it set up right here. We'll open up the Windows Explorer. And if we go into the My Computer C drive, we can see under Program Files, we have let me go ahead and make that a full screen. We have the Microsoft SQL Server directory. If we expand this, we're going to see that we have listings of several different versions that are possible. 80 is equivalent to SQL Server 2000. 90, or like the 9.0, is SQL Server 2005. And 100 is SQL Server 10. To be able to see the installed directories, if we come on down into, say, the program files Microsoft SQL Server, and we open up 100, we have the capability of looking at several items, whether it's the components that have been installed or other items. If we come down to Tools, come over into the bin directory, we have the capability of seeing information about the VS shell. Remember earlier I mentioned that SSMS is part of the Visual Studio development environment. We'll come on down into the common tools to the IDE 
And in here we see several applications that are available to us. To be able to see SSMS, we'll just scroll down and see the SSMS executable file. To be able to look at some of the additional files we can go through here, such as looking at each instance, if I minimize this and go to MSSQL, this provides us the opportunity of looking at some of the instances that may be defined. Now you'll notice that there's not a lot of information here because there are different solutions for a box. MSSQL is the database engine. Looking at MSRS is reporting services and AS is something referred to as analysis services. Let's open up the instance one, drilling down into the binary file, and it is here, as I mentioned, that each instance has its own binary code. If we scroll down, you can see that we have, I need to come down a little bit further, SQLserver.exe. This will be the service that will be available for each of the different instances, whether it's instance 0, 1, or 0, 2, or the default instance itself. Finally, one of the items that you need to be able to take a look at is the registry to be able to see how to view the installation. If I click on Start and go to Run, I can take a look at the registry by doing a reg edit and it brings up our registry. If I go ahead and I expand out the local machine going into software to Microsoft, I can come down here and see some references for Microsoft SQL Server. If I the expand the SQL Server, I can see the different installations that I've created. If we expand instance 01, we can see several items that are put in here and installed. One of the interesting items is what instances are the right names? And if we click on the instance names, we can either look at an OLAP or reporting services or the SQL. This is a quick way if you want to be able to see which specific default or instance names have been created and the association for the specific directories that we saw in Windows Explorer. This is a nice way to be able to look at those direct items. Give that a close. Now be very careful whenever you're working in the registry tool. If you make changes, you could corrupt your database. So it's important to always do a backup. This concludes our demonstration with 01.